my presentation is called Jason Schneiderman's Personal Observations About LGBT Literary Heritage in 10 Rants. But I don't have time for all 10, so you'll get them in pieces. <laughs> Observation two. I'm not entirely sure to what extent being gay has an aesthetic component. I mean, personally, I'm an old school Joan Crawford and Betty Davis movie watching queer who wants nothing more than to go to the sing along sound of music and scream the words to I am what I am at the after party for her rival of Gypsy. But that's really a very specific idea of gayness. And while it was the dominant one for a good 50 years or so, we can think broader, right? We can handle, but can we handle the multiplicities of computers? No, we can't. <laughs> But can we handle the multiplicities of LGBTIQ aesthetics? Certainly, if we can handle bears, twins, clones, daddies, lipsticks, butches, and zombies, as clear gay and lesbian identity, they're terribly zombies, I just want to see your thing. <laughs> we can handle the Essex, Hemphill, Audrey Lord, Allen Ginsberg, Oscar Wilde, Mark Doty, and I put in K. Ryan, is she out? Yes. She yes. Is. Okay, thank God. Yes. <laughs> I realize I had these moments where I'm like, I don't know that they're gay. But um, anyway, are all sort of their own strands of leather in the lantern one weaves at queer writing summer camp, which now actually exists. But at that point, are we a big tent or no tent at all? How do we find queer cohesion when I feel closer to Heather McHugh's work than a gay vampire novel? Observation three. LGBT writing was always fun for me, especially when LGBT life was not. When I went to college, I had a very strong social conscience, and I took being gay quite seriously. I went to lectures on gays in the military, and I coordinated the Day of Silence, and I attended National Coming Out Day around tables, and I was a liaison between the student and faculty groups working for domestic partnership benefits. Does anyone know if Maryland finally gave them to us? The yes. University of Maryland that you have on your lanyards? Thank God. Thank you. It was the first time the ad hoc committee had not followed, or the first time the Board of Regents had not followed the recommendation of the ad hoc committee that they had formed to study an issue. So and my point is that it sucked. Um, we didn't get domestic partnership benefits. Don't ask, don't tell came down the pipe. And the day of silence is stupid. Like, I'm supposed to not talk for like, a day. <laughs> <laughs> but in retrospect, poetry was one place where being gay was fun. I could write coded poems. For example, my notorious poem, Santa Claus, which started with the line, chimneys are an exit, not an entrance. <laughs> which I had to explain during my thesis to them. Was not <laughs> so maybe it's no mistake that writing is what I wanted to be the center of my life. Maybe gay writing has always been fun. Even if the courtroom dramas that gay writing provokes are not fun. Think about Whitman's response to John Addington Simons, right, where Whitman, John Addington Simons says, are these poems about being gay? And Whitman says, what? I've told it everywhere! <laughs> um, so LGBT lit is a place where we can enjoy ourselves, even if we have to be quiet about what it is that we are enjoying. <laughs> Observation five. Gays are incredibly well represented in the Western canon. To quote Eve Sedgwick, who was the gay Shakespeare? Who was the gay Proust? Who was the gay Socrates? Duh. <laughs> Maybe we can convene a panel on finding the heterosexual Shakespeare. Though heterosexual sounds very clinical, and I think we like to be called straight. But, and pointing out that Shakespeare was the gay Shakespeare, we risk again losing our center of gravity and dissipating our identity. If we're at the center of the canon already, what's to talk about? Edmund White, in his most recent memoir, talks about the blue chip artists of the 1960s who didn't come out until they were already quite famous, and for them, their sexuality just became another angle of interest rather than a primary designation, right? Like, it's interesting that Susan Sontag had a partner for most of her life, but it's not, you know, like, where we start. And yet, isn't the idea of a gay aesthetic curiously indebted to non-gays? Madonna, Eve Sedgwick, Betty Davis, Benjamin Disraeli, Gilbert and Sullivan? Okay, I'm on time. I am. This is called gross on YouTube. <laughs> Observation six. LGBT is not a historically stable set of identities, but we do not need LGBT to be an immutable and trans-historical idea in order to think of it as a heritage. 
So I've written at length about this elsewhere, but I really think the no notion of LGBT heritage is difficult because it's hard to really pin down what those letters mean and how they meant it through time. So to take our most recent letter, T, think about how our notion and idea of trans is dependent on technology and the, possibles, the possibilities of medical intervention. There's something fascinating to me about the fact that the cover of Stone Butch Blues declares it to be the novel that first spoke the word transgender, and yet the word transgender is never in the novel. And the happy ending is not when Jess is accepted as a man, though Jess successfully and unhappily passes as a man for part of the book, but rather when, Je when Jess is called sister and is embraced as a woman on her own terms. It seems to me that within trans, there are two competing notions of gender, one that rejects the gender binary as oppressive, and regards body modifications as all being of a part. So my taking Accutane or having a nose job is not all that different from top surgery, right? I don't have to like find some psychiatrist and insist that I was like, I'm really a clear-skinned man. I just wore this mask and really right? <laughs> and another that embraces the gender binary and insists that surgery is a corrective because one belongs in a different body. I'm not suggesting that this contradiction should be decided for one side or the other. What I'm saying is that even within a single identity, there seems to me that there are contradictions which need to be explored and enjoyed, but they complicate the notion of heritage and identity. So was Gertrude Stein trans? Was Vernon Lee trans? Was Quentin Crisp trans? In part, the point of LGBT, or the word queer or queer, um, is to delay this sort of pinning down. Clearly, Gertrude Stein was LGBT or queer, but we can leave open the possibility of how to understand her rather than getting all structuralist on her and demanding that her body and desires yield to categories that we can easily name. And yet, LGBT or queer are categories we can name. I'm arguing that there is value in the dis-ease of that naming. And if you will consider Foucault as a kind of foundational figure, you know, I, you know right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we, were, we, were in, we were in England last year, and they all say it like he's French, like Foucault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Maryland, so I want to say Foucault. And if you consider Foucault as a kind of foundational figure for the kind of discontinuities I'm suggesting we embrace, I was recently reminded by Dennis Altman that Foucault's thinking was inspired by the anti-essentialism of the early gay liberation movement, and in fact. Foucault's desire to efface himself from his work backfired, so Foucault never named his intellectual heritage because he was trying to disappear, but the result was we only saw Foucault and missed his roots, and that erases a body of LGBT activism and thought. Right? So we have this foundational moment that's not foundational at all, but we just missed the roots, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the argument of black you know, on the third day. Observation eight. We kind of don't know what to say about AIDS right now. My husband and I were listening to a remix of Sidewalk Talk, and my husband was like, this is really depressing. And I was like, because it's all synthy and layered and felt super sophisticated in the cities, but now it feels like a two-year-old could mix it. He was like, no, because it reminds me of New York and AIDS ravaged 80s. When you look over for Poets for Life, which is an anthology of poetry about AIDS that Michael Klein edited in the 1990s, you would be shocked by what's there. Ed Hirsch, Heather McHugh, Phyllis Levin, all have very well-known poems included, and yet we don't think of them as being AIDS poems anymore, right? Third person neuter, that's an AIDS poem. Um, in a certain way, the poems that we still know are about AIDS, or by Mark Doty and Marie Howe, Tori Dent, Essex Hemphill, the people who had their lives unmistakably altered by the disease, sometimes ended by the disease, and whose work was unmistakably about it. It would be a mistake to think of David Groff's recent anthology, Persistent Voices of Poets, Lost to AIDS, as a capstone, and yet it does mark the end of a certain era of devastation. We still live with AIDS, even if it has changed so much, since those dark days of the 1980s, and often my first book is about my husband's HIV status, and people will often come to me after a reading, and be like, is your husband okay? And I'm like, what, what happened? Like, what was it? Like, did someone not tell me something that I was reading? And I'm like, oh, right, you read, you don't know that praise inhibitors are really successful for him. But they weren't for everyone. Um, it's just that protease inhibitors have changed the face of HIV, which is a terrible, terrible phrase. I apologize for it, but it's a placeholder for something that has to go there. Uh, but the point is that HIV AIDS shaped the gay community in significant ways that we have yet to really understand or build on in a new era. And this is a very hard conversation to have without acknowledging the severity of racism in the gay community and the very distressing ways the conversations about HIV and AIDS often precipitate some extremely heavy earthquakes as the fault lines of race, class, and geography are put under pressure. And I would, I would strongly suggest here that Lisa Duggan's Twilight of Equality is um, a really great read to look at. Observation 10. It's exciting to me that we can sort of enjoy LGBT identities in all their complexities and messiness. I want to acknowledge our complexity and difficulty so we can get ourselves together. 
In all of this, I've forgotten to say that I felt nurtured by queer writing and queer writers, that I'm incredibly grateful for writers like David Trinidad, Andrew Holleran, and Wayne Kestenbaum because they expanded my idea of what a gay life could be and what my writing could encompass. The importance of building the heritage I spent eight minutes complicating is it allows us to lead more fulfilling lives. At the base of LGBT identity is the belief in the importance of desire and the fulfillment of that desire. Literature offers us intimacy and a spectrum of similarity and difference that we embrace because it makes us whole. It guides us and goads us and creates new desires and new fulfillment. That spectrum is severely impoverished when LGBT voices are silenced, misrecognized, or discounted. I am grateful that I can think about this body of work in difficult ways because the groundwork has been laid for it to be thought about. 